What is up, y'all? It's your boy Lucas, aka Television Tell from TikTok. You already know we love our icebergs around here, so today we're doing the Stranger Things iceberg. I just finished up the series about a week ago, so I might as well do it while it's fresh in my mind. I made this iceberg myself, and there are eight tiers. It's gonna be a decently long video, but I'm excited to get it out. Anyways, let's get right into it. So starting it off, we have tier one, set in the 80s. So pretty much everyone knows the show is set in the 80s, the first season taking place in November of 1983, the second being in 1984, and the third being in the summer of 1985. And the latest season, which is season four, being set in the spring of 1986. Meaning in current time, assuming all of the main characters survive, each kid would be around 50 years old today. I think that being set in the 80s is a really cool feature about the show. It gives a certain style to the show. It helps me learn about what the 80s were like. Assuming that y'all didn't fight Demogorgons in the 80s. And it also gives plenty of room for time skips, which we will absolutely talk about later on. Demogorgons. The Demogorgon was the main antagonist in the first season of the show, but it has been recurring since then. We also see it in season four in the Russian prison. We don't know a whole lot about it, but we know that it's some humanoid creature standing at about nine or 10 feet tall and that it is bloodthirsty thirsty and ready to kill. It terrorized the group in season one, but they did a great job waiting on Eleven to use her powers, and she absolutely annihilated the Demogorgon into oblivion. And then as I mentioned, there was the Demogorgon in the Russian prison that the Russians were using to kill off some of the prisoners. We will definitely see more Demogorgons as the series goes on, and I am looking forward to it because they are fu- terrifying. They're just one big mouth. Vecna is one. We learned this fact at the very end of season four and it completely shocked me. It was a plot twist that I did not expect at all and whether that was me just being narrow-minded and not seeing it or it just was a damn good plot twist. Eleven and one were fighting because one just killed basically every child in the Hawkins lab and Eleven was sick of him so she opened up a gate into the upside down just to send him in. Severely deforming him in the process. He got struck by lightning like right when he got in there. We also know that one is Henry Creel and he killed his entire family except for his father who ended up being the one who got arrested because his entire family was dead and he was the only one left alive except for Henry obviously. This is really high up on the iceberg because it's clearly revealed to us but it's still really interesting and opens up the door for a lot of theories later. Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons is, you know, only the basis of the entire show. Between being the main character's favorite game to play and all of the villains being from Dungeons and Dragons, it matters a lot. But in short, Dungeons and Dragons is a fantasy role-playing type of board game. It really picked up popularity in the 80s and 90s. You go on quests and campaigns and adventures and stuff like that using the game board and a dice. It typically has a stereotype of nerds or unpopular kids that play it, which sets the tone about our main character's stance in the high school social hierarchy record breaking so stranger things has broken quite a few records as a tv show specifically for netflix just because of its insane popularity some of these records include stranger things 4 having the biggest premiere weekend in netflix history also stranger things 4 has become the most viewed english language series on netflix it was the first television series to jump up to the top three of netflix's most popular list within two weeks of premiering you know i usually think that tv shows that are this popular are a bit overhyped but stranger things is such an amazing show i think it does deserves all of this hype. Definitely one of my favorite shows I've ever watched and you can quote me on that. We're already on the tier two, it's gonna get a little bit deeper. Over 1,000 castings. So there was over 1,000 castings to find the perfect fit for the main group of kids. It took 906 boys and 307 girls. I just wanted to include this on here because of how absurd it is. The Duffer brothers really wanted to find the kids that they imagined as the Hawkins Five. And the perfect fit they did find. I mean, I couldn't imagine anyone else playing these roles. Particularly Millie Bobby Brown as Eleven. Talk about a perfect fit, and she's not even American. She puts on a hell of an American accent, though. I also want to include that Millie Bobby Brown really did shave her head for the role of Eleven in season one. Commitment, man. Commitment. Stephen King. So Stephen King is a pretty big Stranger Things fan, which makes sense. This show is right down his alley. But the Duffer Brothers got a lot of inspiration from his works, including It and Carrie. And that scene in the roller rink in season four was very Carrie-esque, if you ask me. Really, Eleven getting bullied in general reminded me of Carrie. And the it connection obviously comes from the group of quote unquote rejects getting themselves into some mess with the paranormal and out of this world creatures. But recently Stephen King has nagged on this show, particularly about the split in season four, Albuquerque and Atlanta. I feel like a lot of people don't know that the primary filming location for the show is in Atlanta. Before season four, it was pretty much just Atlanta, but in season four for the desert scenes where they're in California, they went to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Man, what is it with amazing shows always being filmed in Albuquerque? It genuinely surprised me when I found out they were filming in Atlanta though. And I almost forgot to mention that all of the scenes in the Russian prison are in Lithuania. 
particularly in Vilnius, Lithuania. I don't know how typical it is to travel that far to a foreign country during the filming of a show, but I am glad they did because it really gave an authentic look about that whole area. Alexei's popularity. So Alexei was a Russian scientist that I'm sure you remember that was kidnapped by Hopper, Joyce, and Murray. And if you've seen any Stranger Things media whatsoever, especially after Stranger Things Season 3, you know that Alexei is an absolute fan favorite. As minor of a character he may be, his love for Slurpees has captured the hearts of fans everywhere. He's earned nicknames like the Slurpee King or Slurpee King Alexei. And I love that Stranger Things fans gave so much praise to this man. And he truly deserved better. He was shot and killed by Grigory after being declared a traitor since he was with the Americans. Rejected over a hundred times. Unbelievably, Stranger Things was rejected over a hundred times by a variety of networks and streaming services. The main complaint they heard was that the style of show they were going for with kids as the main characters just wouldn't work. Some networks were willing to take on the show if they scrapped the idea of the kids and just focus in on Hopper, which would still make for a pretty interesting TV show. You know, he's a small time sheriff investigating all this crazy shit. Others were a bit of the opposite. They were only willing to make the show if they made it PG and for kids. Obviously the Duffer brothers refused to do either of these because that defeats the whole purpose of what they wanted to do. Eventually Netflix decided to take a chance on it and oh boy are they they glad that they did. I don't know how that works, but whoever got the final say in that decision, they deserve a raise or a promotion or something. Welcome to tier three of the iceberg. Steve Harrington original character arc. So Steve in the original script was going to be an absolute asshole. Just an 80s style bully. And we kind of saw a little bit of that, but he realized how he was being and that he shouldn't act like that. But in the original writing, no, he, he was never going to have that realization. It would just be him being ignorant as hell for the rest of the season until his death later in season one, because that was also supposed to happen. I'm glad they decided to change his fate though. I just couldn't imagine the show without him. The Montauk Project. Montauk. Good to know. The Montauk Project was allegedly a mind control experiment that the US government was doing during the Cold War. They would run all sorts of psychological torture-esque experiments, and for some of the subjects they would even use a high frequency to tap into their consciousness to create a super soldier that is controlled completely under their will. There's, there's, there's a lot going on. But the most important part is that their test subjects would be abandoned children, or kidnapped children. Does this sound a tad bit familiar? Now from what I could find, the Montauk Project is pretty much just fiction. Like, it is a conspiracy theory, but I don't think there's any weight or proof behind it. But with some of the other things the government has done, you just never know. The Duffer Brothers have openly said that they have used the Montauk Project as a heavy reference for the show. And the show was even originally going to take place in Montauk, New York and be called Montauk. Similar to Hawkins, Montauk is a very tiny town, so you can kind of see where that inspiration came from. But the Montauk Project is a very fascinating conspiracy theory, even if it might just be fiction. And if you ever have some time on your hands, go read up on it, because I promise you it's worth your while. Cleidocranial Dysplasia so this is mentioned briefly by Dustin in the first episode, but Dustin and Gajin Matarazzo, who plays Dustin, has a genetic condition called cladocranial dysplasia. It affects teeth and bones, like the skull, face, collarbone, and sometimes legs. Around 1 in 1 million people have it, so it's a pretty rare condition, but it generally has no effect on the person besides the way they look. And we do see Dustin has some of these traits associated with cladocranial dysplasia. As he mentions a few times, he has no collarbone. I thought I'd put this on the iceberg because it's pretty interesting. Plus, I love Dustin and how they incorporated Gaten Matarazzo's condition into his character. Hopper as a levy. All right, I'm about to talk about the most sinister entry in this iceberg, so prepare yourself. There's a satire video out there of David Harbour who plays Hopper in an interview where he states he originally wanted the role of Eleven, but the way he does it just cracks me the hell up. We have this grown ass man acting out the role of a little girl, but damn it is he acting it well. Like David said, Millie Bobby Brown did a good job as Eleven, but David could have brought something to the table that Millie just can't. I think David Harbour should have gotten the role. The Nether. This was the original name for the Upside Down in seasons 1 and 2. They were never supposed to refer to it as the Nether in a speaking sense. Like none of the characters actually call it the Nether. But in all of the scripts it set the scene as the Nether. The Upside Down is just a lot simpler. It is the Upside Down of the real world. And it makes a lot more sense for the characters to call it that as that would be their initial reaction to it. But the name The Upside Down just stuck so much that they exclusively refer to it as that now. They decided to scrap the whole The Nether thing. And that's probably for the better because whenever I think of The Nether, I think of Minecraft. But last time I checked, there are no Demogorgons in Minecraft, 
nor are there any pig people in Stranger Things. We're already halfway through, baby. We're on tier four. 30 page document on the upside down. On the set of Stranger Things, there is a 30 page document written by the Duffer Brothers on what exactly the upside down is. From what I understand, it pretty much thoroughly explains everything from its origins to what monsters are there to why there aren't more monsters to where the monsters came from, all of that. But they also did say they want the upside down to be somewhat unknowable even to them. They want it to be up for discussion. I thought at some point I read somewhere that the Duffer Brothers let some members of the cast read it to better understand the Upside Down, but I cannot find any interview or news article to confirm that. I'm gonna need to head down to Atlanta and take that document though. Not even to leak it, just to read it myself. Then I leak it. Video game references. So there are quite a few references and different inspirations used by the Duffer Brothers for Stranger Things involving video games specifically. Silent Hill is one of the biggest ones I could find. Now I've never played Silent Hill, but from what I've read there's a sort of shadow world or realm that mirrors the real world, but it's a much darker version. Not to mention after looking at some of the monsters in Silent Hill, they could definitely pass off as monsters in Stranger Things, and vice versa. Dark Souls was another inspiration that I found really interesting. So they claim that in Dark Souls you feel a bit on edge and a bit uncomfortable. The Duffer Brothers want you to feel that exact same way while the characters are in the Upside Down. Just a sense of uncertainty about what the hell is about to happen, and you gotta be ready for anything. They also love the storytelling in The Last of Us. There may be a similarity there between Hopper and Eleven and Joel and Ellie. But yeah, video games played an important role in the making of Stranger things. Book series. There are a few books and comics based off Stranger Things, but none of them are accepted as canon. Since the books aren't written by the Duffer Brothers directly, what they say could completely contradict what the brothers have planned for us in the future. The comics and the books go a lot more in depth about what happened at the lab in Hawkins. They talk about the different patients in the lab and their separate backstories. There are really interesting books that I recommend you give a read about Hopper's past, Eleven's mom's backstory, Max's backstory, and Robin in high school. While they aren't canon, they are very entertaining. Vecna kidnapped Will. This is a theory that in the first season, the Demogorgon didn't take Will. It was actually Vecna that took him. Some supporting evidence includes you can kinda hear a grandfather clock in the scene where Will is getting taken. Although that might not be a grandfather clock, it could just be any noise. And when Will is in the upside down, he is singing his favorite song. Like, constantly. So that could have easily drove Vecna away from killing him. It's possible, but it's still kind of a stretch. <laughs> Operation MK Ultra. This is where it gets crazy. So this isn't a conspiracy. This actually happened. Operation MK Ultra was a real mind control experiment done by the CIA in order to get an advantage against Russia in the Cold War. There was a lot of inhumane experiments done on people, including testing early versions of LSD and other psychedelic drugs, sleep deprivation experiments, and just general physical and mental abuse on people. But in Stranger Things, MK Ultra is intertwined with Dr. Brenner and Hawkins' lab. Eleven's mom was a part of these experiments in the 50s and 60s, and Dr. Brenner was the head doctor in one of them. These were all done at Hawkins' lab. They also used MK Ultra as a sort of reference for the show, and the experiments done on the kids at Hawkins' lab did kind of mirror MK Ultra. Some people do know about this, but the reason it's tier 5 is because MK Ultra was just such a crazy experiment to me. And it's another one of those things where I'm not going to go completely in depth in it today. Robin is a Russian spy. So I know this theory may present itself as really far out there, and it kind of is. But if you think this is crazy, just wait till the Robin theory later on. So some of this theory stems from how Robin comes out of literally nowhere. We never see her at all at the school, but she seems to know a whole lot about Steve, Nancy, and Jonathan. Maybe that's because she was told a lot of information on them. She also picked up Russian very fast. Also, when we see her and Steve get kidnapped by the Russians, they barely lay a finger on her, yet they beat the absolute hell out of Steve. Her main motives as a spy would be to learn more about Eleven, the lab, the knowledge the US has on the Upside Down, and the Upside Down in general. Maybe they wanted her, Steve, and Dustin to get close to the gate so she could gain their trust, ultimately gaining the trust of the whole group. I don't know, this theory is a pretty big stretch, but a really entertaining theory nonetheless. It reminds me of Thomas from Regular Show, if you've ever seen that. Spinoff confirmed. So it hasn't been officially, officially confirmed. But we all know that Stranger Things is gonna have a spinoff. A show this popular, not making a spinoff would just be a bad business decision. But the Duffer Brothers have voiced that they have a super unique idea for a spinoff that they're excited about, but they haven't even started writing it yet. They claim that this idea is very, very different. But somehow Finn Wolfhard, who plays Mike, managed to guess it. Besides him and the Duffer Brothers, no one else knows what this spinoff is about. Now as to what my guess is, the only super unique idea I could think of is some kind of upside down spinoff. But I would love to see a spinoff with Jim Hopper or any of the main characters really. Or you know, the spinoff we don't want, but we need Murray. 
Origins. Eleven created the Upside Down. This is a theory saying that when Eleven was fighting Henry Creel or One, she generated so much energy with her powers that she created the alternate reality known as the Upside Down. Now imagine how much energy and power she had to use to create a whole dimension. In fact, Imagine how angry she had to be at Henry Creel. We do know for sure that this was the first gate created into the Upside Down, but we're not sure if it existed prior to this. I don't think there's a whole lot of evidence for this theory because let's face it, it's hard to prove it, but there's some evidence that contradicts it. The main one for me being that when one gets blasted into the Upside Down, there are tentacles that start coming out of the entrance that Eleven created. There's also the fact that Millie Bobby Brown said herself that she doesn't think Eleven created the Upside Down. Rather, it's always been there as a separate reality. The Season 5 IT Theory So the Duffer Brothers have already confirmed there to be a time skip, most likely to catch up with the actors' ages, but what if the time skip was just a little bit longer than people anticipated? It would be the characters completely done with high school, maybe even done with college, being around 24 or 25 years old, and they would all come back to Hawkins to finish what they started in Season 4. The reason it's called the IT Theory is because Stephen King's IT did the same sort of thing. The characters came back when they were way older to defeat Pennywise, but I'm wondering if the Duffer Brothers will do a similar thing. You know, maybe we'll see Lucas still by Max, even though she's still in a coma, even years later. Maybe we'll see Will finally open with his sexuality. Maybe Mike and Eleven are still a thing. I mean, who knows? But I do think a time skip like this would benefit the show a lot. Maybe not an eight or nine year time skip like I'm talking about for this theory, but a two or three year time skip? Sure. <laughs> Eleven will be the final villain. I personally love this theory. It basically states that Eleven will fall victim to the Mind Flayer or Vecna, most likely the Mind Flayer, and become controlled by them. And it all stems from Eddie's GND campaign at the beginning of season four. So they're trying to defeat the final boss and it's Dustin's turn to roll. But he rolls an 11, which is not enough to defeat the boss. So there's quite a bit of foreshadowing there because in season one, Will failed to get a high number on his dice roll and then later he gets kidnapped by the Demogorgon and dragged into the upside down. And Dustin rolls an 11, 11, which isn't enough. But what's even better about this theory is Callie, who's number eight, may be reintroduced because of this. Maybe they find a way to contact her or she finds out about Eleven falling to the Mind Flayer. Maybe it would take both of their powers to win. I also saw someone said that 11 plus 8 plus 1 equals 20, which is the number that Erica rolled in Eddie's campaign to ultimately defeat the final boss. And you know, 11, 8, and 1. All characters that are involved in this. And I doubt that they introduced Callie's character for just one episode. And I think out of all of the theories on here, this is one of the most likely ones. The Russians are training Demogorgons. So originally I made this entry before Volume 2 came out, and I explained that the Russians already have their hand on one Demogorgon, so who's saying they don't have more? And well, they kind of teased this a little bit in Volume 2. The Russians are definitely experimenting with creatures from the Upside Down, other Demogorgons, and Demodogs. Now what they're most likely trying to do is train them, make their mind completely controlled by Russia. Russia. And we know from Dustin's old pet Dart that these creatures can be compliant. Training multiple Demogorgons would be kind of tough. And obviously they didn't train the one Demogorgon well enough because it slaughtered pretty much the whole Russian prison before being taken down by Hopper. So it would be a lot of trial and error, but maybe Russia can do it. The show is just one elaborate D&D game. The entire show, yes, I mean all of it, is just one elaborate D&D game played by Will, Mike, Lucas, and Dustin. They are just really into whatever campaign they're doing. Now, while I can't answer if Eleven and Max were characters in the game or people that they brought on to play D&D with them, this theory really can't be disproven. It's like those dream theories with literally any other TV show ever, where it's like, oh, the whole show was just a bad dream. And the main character's fine, and none of the actual characters really existed. But imagine at the very end, it just cuts to all of them playing D&D, and the whole show just didn't happen. The internet would explode, and Stranger Things fans everywhere would go insane. Well, would you look at that? We're on tier seven. The Walking Dead is in the same universe as Stranger Things. There is a reason that this theory is so far down here. Basically what it's saying is the Upside Down somehow created the virus. This wouldn't be until decades later because The Walking Dead doesn't take place until 2010, at least the TV show. Now we haven't seen any capability from the Upside Down to create a virus. We know that people can get sick in the Upside Down from breathing in the air, but we haven't seen any zombie turning virus yet. 
Maybe the Upside Down is full of horrible spores and viruses that, if released into the real world, could cause some chaos, like a zombie apocalypse. It is a very fun theory, especially for me, because The Walking Dead is one of my favorite shows, and Eleven would mess some people up in The Walking Dead. Negan stands no chance against Eleven. But to be completely honest with you, when it comes to implausible and stretched theories, this theory not just takes the cake, but it takes the whole bakery along with it. Here's the other Robin theory. Robin is a time traveler for the US government. It's like the complete opposite of the theory we saw earlier. And let me give credit to Farid123456 on Reddit because he did a good job cooking up this theory. So instead of being a Russian spy, Robin actually works for the US government as a time traveler from the future. Again, the points earlier where no one remembers her from school, yet she has all this information on Steve, Nancy, and Jonathan, that point would still apply to this theory. She's staying in the past as of now because her mission is not yet accomplished. She has already seen the Back to the Future movies too, which would have been pretty new for the time. Although she could have just watched them like a few days before, but it's still a point to remember. And while I think this point I'm about to talk about is a bit absurd, it even goes as far to say that Robin is faking her sexuality to avoid a relationship with Steve. Because if they started dating, that could completely mess up the future. And if there's one thing that TV shows have taught me, it's to not do that. Again, this theory is a very big stretch, like most of the ones down here, but it's interesting to consider and it makes you look at her character a lot different. One is the father to all of the children in the lab. Since one, or Henry Creel, was assumingly the first test subject that had powers, this theory suggests that they used his DNA to make all of the other kids too, which would ultimately mean he's the father to all of the kids in the lab. Considering we know absolutely nothing about Eleven's dad, maybe it's not that far out there. As for the rest of the kids in the lab, we know nothing about their backstories anyways. But it makes the fact that one killed all of the kids in the lab besides Eleven so much more disturbing. He's killing his kids, he's killing his offspring. Going along with this theory, they might not be his kids in a traditional sense, but they probably have some of his DNA somehow. Personally, I think this theory really spices things up, but do I buy it? Yeah, sure, I buy it. It's interesting, what can I say? So for the last year, I'm gonna talk about how I think the show is gonna end. Someone from the main group will die, my guess, 11. I'm gonna assume she's gonna make some crazy sacrifice in order to restore balance in Hawkins, to just make it a normal small town again. But there will be a duo or maybe just one person in the group that will leave Hawkins on some journey or mission, igniting the potential for a future spinoff. Then there's gonna be what's left of the main group all living out in Hawkins, playing that one last game of D&D while everyone else sits around laughing, watching, talking. All of the characters we've grown to love just in Mike's basement. Now as to what mission the one or two people might be going on to ignite the spinoff, I have no idea. Maybe Eleven didn't actually die and Mike's going out to find her. There's a lot of routes they can go. And call me corny if you want, I think this is a beautiful ending. So that is it for the Stranger Things Iceberg. If you have any video suggestions for the future, just let me know. This is Lucas signing out. As always, have a blessed day.